Father, we thank you and bless your name. What a good God, a great God, a loving God you are. We thank you for what you've been doing and what you are still doing. And I pray that everyone in our service today, everyone connected with us, none will go back home empty-handed in Jesus' name. And I pray that your people here, your people there all over, none of us will worship you in vain in Jesus' name. Bless everyone today. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. God bless you. You can sit down today. We're looking at an event that happened in the time of Jesus. A story, a true story of somebody coming to the Lord, having a desire that he would have eternal life. And it is so important that it is recorded in Matthew, in Mark, and Luke, almost all the same with a little, little variations as supplied by the Spirit of God. We're looking at just one of those passages. We're looking at Mark chapter 10. And I'm reading from verse 17. Mark chapter 10. We're looking at verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Look at that verse, very important. He came running. That's good. If he had continued coming to Christ, running, coming to Christ, running, coming to Christ, running, everything would have been fine. But you know, many people, they have passion and zeal and desire and they run to Christ at the earlier time but now for the rest of their lives now for the rest of their sojourn here on earth they do not keep running passionate about Christ wanting everything of Christ and then we're told and he kneeled to him he submitted to him he kneeled he knelt down that is the challenge with people. They come at the first time, they submit, they bend, they kneel, they hold him high, but in their lives, they do not keep kneeling, submitting unto him all through their lives. That's the problem with many people. At the beginning, at the commencement, when they come to the Lord, they're submissive, they kneel down, but the kneeling does not continue. And ask him, that's the problem. They do not keep on asking the Lord, I need, I want something eternal. I want something unsurpassable and the, he asked the Lord at the beginning he didn't keep on asking only the Lord that's the problem with many of us because at the first time when we came we're so zealous we ran and we will not look at anything only run to Christ and then we kneel down to him we say you are Lord, you are master, you are the creator. But many people, after that initial time, they don't continue. They was asking, he said, good master. If we could continue like that and understand that this is the teacher come from God and this is the master, the master of the universe and this is the good one, whatever wind may blow, whatever watch we may hear, whatever answer he may give to us, we always know he is a good master. If something is delayed, if he's still looking at us and watching what will happen, we know he he is good all the time. If we can have that concept, whatever is happening in our lives, and understand that this is the good master will do well. But 
when Jesus gave the answer to him, he changed his mind. He wasn't the good master anymore. And he wasn't about to still run to Christ anymore. He wasn't about to believe the Lord and submit to him anymore. He said, what shall I do? That I may inherit eternal life. If that question could be on our mind all through our lives, that anytime we're coming to the Lord, what good thing shall I do to inherit eternal life? And whenever we're praying, we'll make that eternal life the subject of the highest interest in our lives. That even though we ask before, now we're saved. We're still asking the Lord, what should I do? That that eternal life will be secured and I will not miss that eternal life. If that question could be on our heart every time, that all we're looking for, all we're searching for, is not to be this or that life. Eternal life, everlasting life. That Lord, wherever you lead me to, and in whatever continent I find myself, all I'm asking for is, if I do this, will I have eternal life? If I continue like this, will I have eternal life? If I give myself my attention to this, will that deprive me of eternal life? If all our lives, the question we asked at the beginning, that we want eternal life, that is the question still on our lips. That will be wonderful. I pray the desire, the passion, the prayer for eternal life will never leave us in Jesus' name. We're looking at verse 18. In verse 18, Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? Now tell me, why are you calling Jesus good? Is that because he healed the sick? Because he multiplied bread? Because he gave the fish and multiplied? Are you thinking of him at a human level? If you are thinking of him at a human level, why callest thou me at the human level good? There is none good but one that is God. Then in verse 19, in verse 19, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father. Honor thy father. Honor thy father and mother. In verse 20, and he answered, and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Think about that. It was not a kind of deeply sinful and deeply defiled person. There are people that will take the Ten Commandments and they hang it at the wall, like you hang your calendar at the wall. And that decalogue, that is the Ten Commandments, they hide there, they read it every time. It's like for them, we we'll call it matra. It's like for them, the word that guides them every time. And anything that happens, they remember because they always read it on the wall, one, two, to ten. And yet, do you know, that doing that, this man shows us that a man can do all that and have not eaten alive and still be empty at heart and still be kind of divided in his heart. Will this give me eternal life? You can take all the commandments, you cannot do them perfectly. To the point it will earn you. It is not what we earn by what we do. It is what the grace of God does in our lives. He had done all this and look at verse 21. In verse 21, then Jesus beholding him loved him. Then Jesus beholding him 
loved him. He didn't say that's a lie. He didn't say, no, you have not been doing that. He actually had been doing that, but he didn't have eternal life because it is not the work of our hands, neither the zeal we manifest by ourselves. The natural man, whatever he has done, whatever good thing he has done in the world, cannot earn him eternal life. Eternal life only comes from Jesus Christ who died and he gave his life for us so that we can have life through him. Do you notice something here? Beholding him loved him and you know Jesus love is not a kind of hypocritical love it's real love coming from his heart God is love and Jesus is love and Jesus loved him can I tell you something the love of Jesus alone without your response can not save you for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes the love of God by itself, the love of Jesus by itself cannot give you eternal life. There must be a response from your side. There must be a submissiveness from your side. And there must be a yielding to what he demands. You must do that. It is the response to the redemption in the love of Christ that saves us. You know, some people, they're living in sin. And then you say, when would you repent and be saved? <laughs> and they say, I am saved by the love of God. Doesn't matter what I do. Doesn't matter what lies I tell. Doesn't matter what money I steal. Doesn't matter what covetousness I have in my heart. And doesn't matter my insubordinate action to Christ. He loves me. I am saved by the love of Christ doesn't work that way. We must respond. This man that came running and this man that even asked a great question, good master, what good thing should I do to inherit eternal life? Keep the commandments. I've been keeping them without interruption. I've been keeping them from my youth. And Jesus loved him. But with that love, he still went back sad and sorrowful because there was something he was holding he couldn't drop. And then it says, one thing thou lackest. One thing thou lackest. We may do a lot of things and then we lack just one thing and just one thing we might have done all this from our days from the days of our youth and then at this moment now one thing thou lackest and the lord in his goodness reveals that one thing unto us you cannot say well god knows I've done all these many things and they were good. But this one thing, I don't think I want to do this one thing. Only one thing cannot, you know, take the eternal life from me. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. It can. Because when Jesus said one thing, that like has go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast. I about that. Sell whatsoever thou hast. Now you can hear the word. You may think you understand the word. What Jesus was saying is, forsake what you have. You have hundredfold. Give up what you have. Heaven will supply hundredfold. You are not a loser by giving up what he tells you to give up because he has in mind that if you will do that a hundredfold of blessing, it will add on. The man did not understand. And it is that lack of understanding that God is saying, can you give up this? I'm waiting for you. When you give that up, I'm going to multiply everything you give up and then you'll be happier 
a life than if you had kept all those things. One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Treasure in heaven. Do this. Obey me. You call me good master. I give you good word. Do that. And you will have treasure in heaven. The man did not obey Christ. Did not do what he had. What he had been told. And instead of having treasure in heaven. He opted for torment in hell. Because he will not have eternal life. Already he knew now from Christ, the giver of eternal life, that he did not have eternal life. He did not have treasure in heaven. Rather, he had torment in hell. And it says, and come, take up thy cross and follow me. Then in verse 22, we're told, and he was sad at that scene and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, he now tells us, then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left or others have done it why can't you do it others have left their nets why can't we do it others have left the multitude of fish they caught why can't they do it others have left everything and they have followed christ the savior why can't we do it and then in verse 29 it says in verse 29 then and jesus answered and said verily verily i say unto you there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel's sake in verse 30 but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life we're looking at the message today seeking the Savior for genuine salvation and eternal life. Three things we're looking at. Number one, seeking eternal life without forsaking earthly lusts. Number two, souls eternal life through faith in the emancipating Lord. Number three, sustained excelling liberality and favors for earnest evangelizing laborers. Let's look at number one. Number one, seeking eternal life, not without forsaking earthly lusts. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 19, we're reading from verse 16, and behold, one came and said unto him, Master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? That's the question, a good question. There are people that ask questions and they're not ready for the answer. This man asked a question and he wasn't ready for the answer. Whenever we ask a question, we should be ready and we should be waiting for whatever answer the Lord will give rather than you have an idea of the answer you want the master to give. And then if he gives that answer, you're not, you're, you, I thought so, I thought, I thought so. If you thought so, why didn't you do it? Why are you coming to ask the question? But then, after asking the question, 
and say, good master, you know it's good. It's going to give you a good answer. It's going to give you a good solution. It's going to give you a good response, good master. It says, what good thing shall I do? You're expecting that what he tells you will be the good thing you're expected to do. Whenever you ask a question, be sincere and be waiting and be ready and be available for the answer it will give and it will be different from the answer you were expecting because if you knew the answer why would you come and ask again and then but this man that I may inherit eternal life I've been doing a lot, a lot of things but what I do now I want to do that that I may inherit that I may have eternal life. We're dividing this to three parts. Number one, seeking eternal salvation without entire surrender. He should have made up his mind when coming. This is Christ. This is the Savior. This is Lord. I'm willing to submit to him. And whatever he asks me, that I will do. When we're coming to church, we don't know what we're going to hear. If we knew, why would we come? We come because we want eternal life. We know that everything we have done on earth will not earn eternal life. And so we come to church. And we're saying, Lord, speak to my heart today. And whatever you say, I know it will direct me to having and inheriting eternal life. Then we must have entire surrender, complete submission unto him. Number two, seeking everlasting satisfaction without forsaking endangering substance we want to have eternal everlasting satisfaction that should be our goal every time and then we should be willing to forsake any substance that will endanger that eternal everlasting satisfaction we're seeking number three is seeking empty supplies for the eternal soul our soul is eternal and then we're seeking and searching things mundane things of life that will not satisfy our eternal soul look at number one number one is uh, seeking eternal salvation but there must be with that entire surrender. We're looking at uh, Mark again and we're re reading from chapter 10 verse 19. In Mark chapter 10 verse 19 thou knowest the commandments do not commit adultery do not kill do not steal do not bear false witness defraud not honor thy father and mother. Then in verse 20, in verse 20 it says, He answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. In verse 21, it says, Then Jesus, who knows the heart of all men, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One Thin thou lackest. If the Lord were to talk to you this day, this moment, and he will tell you, one thing thou lackest, what will that be? Think about that. One thing thou lackest, what will it be? Will it be that you are not consistent with your faith, your confession? And your profession one thing thou lackest would it be you are not steady sometimes up sometimes down something sometimes in agreement with the lord and something sometimes oh oh i don't agree with that 
the Lord is saying it and the Lord is pointing the finger to me I don't accept sometimes positive I want to run sometimes negative it says one thing thou lackest what would he have told you exterior good interior bad sinful exterior you look nice you look righteous on the exterior on the inside not so righteous one thing thou lackest go thy way sell whatsoever thou hast what Jesus saying kick away the idol from your life money possession had become an idol and he embraced that all the time and he would not think about the Lord because he had all the property he had all the idol in his heart what idol are you keeping and the Lord said he will not share his glory with any man with any woman with any idol and that idol that you hold on to and you say I want eternal life and the Lord is saying one thing you love this above me you give your heart to this above me can you give that up you want eternal life all idols must go you must throw them away and this one now you are so kind of covetous and you're so kind of intimate and you're so kind of glued to your idol that you will not part with it somebody may be dying and he needs money for survival somebody may be hungry and is hungry even to death and you will not part with that idol now get yourself away from the idol remove that idol from your heart whoever you love whatever you love above christ above the word above your salvation above eternal life you will get rid of that idol give to the poor and thou shall have a treasure in heaven you talk about heaven you pray about heaven and you want to be there in heaven a seat in heaven a mansion in heaven you want to be a partaker of the promises of god in heaven now do this get yourself totally separated from every idol and then come to me and then follow me and take me as your only lord and savior and you think about me every time and you follow me every time look at this in verse 22 now and it was sad anything that will take that idol from him he was sad it's a woman anything that will take that woman from me he was sad it's a man anything that will take that man from me he was sad it's pleasure anything that will take that pleasure from me is uh, he was sad it's self-will i will do what i would anything that will take that self-will from me he was sad what are you sad about? What's it? Replacing Christ in your life and the Lord is saying, you call me Lord, you call me Master, you call me Savior, you call me Sanctifier, you call me Baptizer and Holy Ghost, you call me Redeemer, you call me Healer, but I am not number one in your life. If you are going to get your life eternal, take that thing that has been number one and you make me number two. Take it away from number one and make me number one in your life and follow me and you'll have eternal life. Are you happy at that or are you sad at that? It says it was sad at that saying and went with greed for a heart great possessions the great provider is not number one the great propitiation for a sinner is not number one and the great prince from heaven is not number one in his life he had 
great possessions. We're coming to number two here. Number two, we're looking at seeking everlasting satisfaction without forsaking endangering substance. There are some substances, some of them physical, that endanger our physical life. They endanger our spiritual life. They endanger our eternal life, spiritual. And this man had substance. And the substance endangered his satisfaction everlasting. And so, because of that, he couldn't have everlasting life. Can I sit down in my private uh, chamber? and think through, is there anything in this world? Is there anyone in this world that if the person forsakes the Lord, that I will follow him, I'll follow her, because he is so precious, and she is so precious, that if he decides, if she decides, I'm not following anymore. I'll say, please, please, please stay because of me. And then the fellow says, I've made up my mind. I say, okay, okay, where are you going? We'll go together. That's your idol. That you cannot give up that person, that sinner, that backslider, that prodigal son, that prodigal person, because he's going to the far country. How can I live without him, without her being with me? That is the idol and it wants you to search your heart and search your life if there is anything any substance if there any substance you are injecting it to yourself it makes you feel high it makes you feel great it makes you feel so courageous you can play any game on any field when that substance is inside you now the lord is saying one thing thou lackest that you will seek strength from the lord alone courage from the lord alone you will seek success from the lord alone and if you're going to make the lord alone your strength you have to forsake that substance are you sad are you saying uh, I'll have the bad effect in my system? If I forsake that substance, there we are. We cannot just be seeking uh, eternal satisfaction, everlasting satisfaction by word of mouth. We have to totally give ourselves to the Lord so that we will have whatsoever he is uh, asking uh, of us. We're looking at Mark chapter 10, reading from verse 23. In Mark chapter 10, verse 23, Jesus looked around about and says unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches, you understand, that riches have had them, riches possess them. How hard shall it be for the people that their money are possessed? They're not just possessing money. Money has possessed them. How hard will it be for the people that the substance of the world has possessed? They're not just possessing the substance. It's possessing them. It will be hard for them to enter into the kingdom of God. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, and the disciples were astonished at his word but jesus answered again and says unto them children how hard is it for them that trust in riches that trust in riches the riches on the one hand the redeemer on the other hand we should trust the redeemer as our substitute as the final sacrifice, as our Savior. But instead of the man trusting the Redeemer, he trusts his riches. How far can riches go? Riches cannot go as far as heaven. The riches may go as far as the store. 
where you purchase things. The riches may go as far as a part of the earth where the riches will help you to travel to. But the riches cannot even go as far as giving you happiness, as giving you peace of mind. The riches cannot even go as far as keeping your family together. The riches cannot go as far as training, transforming your children, that your children live a righteous life. The riches may be able to purchase something physical if it cannot even go too far here on earth. The riches cannot go as far as heaven. Heaven. You see, it's the Redeemer, not the riches, that will give us everything it takes to get to heaven. And so it says, as the disciples were so surprised, as the disciples were astonished, Jesus said, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. God. It tells us in verse 25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. It's telling us then, as we come to seek the Lord, and we come to seek eternal, everlasting, heavenly satisfaction from Him. We must be willing to forsake all endangering substances. We're looking at number three here. Number three here, we're looking at seeking empty supplies for the eternal soul. Our soul is eternal. And all the things of the earth cannot reach the soul, cannot save the soul, cannot satisfy the soul. And all the things we're seeking for, seeking empty supplies. Can we think together that in life we spent six full days, Monday through Saturday, and we're seeking and seeking and seeking things that will not satisfy the soul, that can only give food to the body, drink to our system, and can only give these temporal things to our body. We still have our spirit, we still have our soul, and we have the eternal element in us that when we die, we go to the other side, either to this side on the left or that side on the right. And we barely spend a fraction of a day, Sunday, seeking for the salvation of the soul. And then all the other six days were heads and shoulders into the earth wanting to seek for sand and cement and, you know, the things on the surface of the earth. And they don't satisfy. And yet, all these years we've gone through that, we've not thought and changed our perspective and seek for the things that satisfy the soul. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 8. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 8, it shall even be as when an hungry man dreameth, and behold, he eateth, but he awaketh, and his soul is empty. All the things of life, the people are running after, they are called the mirage of life. When you are traveling, you look ahead, looks like you see a pool of water in front of you. It's a mirage. It's a mirage. And then when you get there, it's gone. Then you look ahead again, the pool of water has shifted to a farther distance and you are very thirsty and you are going on and going on when you get there it's vanished away it's the mirage of life it says your soul you're thirsty 
And then in the dream, we daydream a lot. The daydreaming will tell us, we'll have that, we'll have that, we'll have that, we'll have that. And eventually we get there, we say, it's only daydreaming. There's no reality there. And it says, you drink in the dream and you wake up and the soul is empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreameth and behold, he drinketh. And he awakes, and behold, he is faint, and the soul has appetite. So shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. Look at Isaiah chapter 28, verse 20. In chapter 28, verse 20, it says, For the bed is shorter that a man can stretch himself on. Everything we do in life, everything we seek in life, everything we amass together on earth, everything we think will satisfy us, it says it's just like a bed that is shorter than a man's height, that he can stretch himself on it, and the covering is narrower than he can wrap himself in it. Think about that. The bed is shorter than your height or how tall you are. And the cover cloth is shorter than you can cover yourself in. It does not satisfy. We're looking at Luke. Chapter 16, reading from verse 22. Luke, chapter 16, verse 22. And it came to pass when the beggar died, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The beggar did not have all the satisfaction he needed here, but only for 70, 80, 100 years. But then he went to Abraham's bosom. 70, 80, 100, 1,000, a million years, a trillion years, forever and ever. Long satisfaction. Brief and short dissatisfaction. On the other hand, the rich man died also. And he was buried. In verse 23, we're told in verse 23, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Verse 24, it says, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. He had the empty supply that could not prepare him for heaven. He had that brief supply for 70, 80, or 100 years, and then he went to the other side. When he got to the other side, he discovered that the torment, the pain, the emptiness, and the helplessness in hell continued beyond a hundred years, beyond a thousand years, beyond a million years, forever and ever, a brief period of satisfaction here on earth, a long, eternal, everlasting period of having torment and no drop of water to cool his tongue. And in verse 25, it says, but Abraham said, son, remember that thou in the lifetime of less than a hundred years, thou receive thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou tormented. Look at verse 26. And beside all this, 
between us and you. There is a great God fix so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass unto us that would come from this. What a pity for that man. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two, we're looking at souls eternal life through faith in the emancipating Lord. Souls eternal life through faith in the emancipating Lord. We're looking at three things here. Number one, we're looking at repentance and forsaking sins before eternal life. Number two, receiving and faith in the Savior for eternal life. Number three, redemption and following his steps into everlasting life. Look at number one. Number one is repentance and forsaking sins before we can have before we can partake of, before we can enjoy eternal life. In Mark chapter 10, reading from verse 21, Mark chapter 10, verse 21, then Jesus beholding him, loved him. He loved him because he came, he ran to Christ. He loves us, we run to the church, we come. I want to hear his word. We come. I want to know his mind. What do you tell me? I want eternal life. And because of that, we come. He loves us. And then we've been trying to do, uh, you have a load to carry. And you don't have extra strength from outside yet. And you bend down and you carry your load until further help will come. He loves us. For, we do what we can do. And then we're waiting for him to help us do what we could not do in ourselves. And we're sensible enough to know that there is the good master, there is the good teacher, there is the good savior, there is the good redeemer that will help us and give us the grace that will live as, so that we can get to it. Because of that, he loves us. He loved him and said unto him, one thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and take up the cross, and follow me. What if the man has said, Christ, I want you, but I don't have the strength. What you are telling me now, I believe in the right answer. I wish I could do that. But I don't have the strength and the power in me to do it. Can you give me grace? Can you give me enablement? Paul the Apostle said, the grace of God enabled him. The grace of God can enable us if we ask him. But he didn't ask. He was a self made man and he thought if I'm going to drop that if I'm going to have eternal life I can do it by myself but I cannot and then he went away don't go away stay there ask him for the grace you're falling and falling and falling don't say there's no point you're falling because you depended on your own strength why don't you come and believe in the Lord and depend on him and then he will help you to have the grace and the mercy that will grant you eternal life look at verse 28 in verse 28 peter began to say unto him lo we have led all we have led all the man could not leave what the lord said sell it give it away come follow him other people have done it how he said by their strength we know we know that peter did not have the strength to do that all by himself lord is that you walking on the water yes i am if you are the one bid me come unto thee 
He said, come. And the grace put him on the water. And the spirit put him on the water. And he walked and went to Jesus. Whatever we cannot do in our own strength is giving us that. You want eternal life. You want eternal life so desperately. Then ask him for grace. And he will help you and enable you and you'll be able to do it but then you have to have faith in him we have left all and we have followed thee by grace by grace too we can come by grace too we can receive help it says we shall come to him boldly to give us grace and mercy and grace to help in the time of need it said in all sin, um, Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Here is, uh, here is a believing church now, and the angel of the church, the leader of the church. You have done this well, you have done this well, you have done this well. One thing I have that you lack. One thing you have left your first love. You cannot say there's no point. What can I do? My first love. How do we lose our first love? Our first love is singular. Our first love is spectacular. Our first love is him. And him alone without a rival. Without a rival. And now as we go on, other things come. Other things are presented to us. We love them. And we only have this love. We take a part of that love and give to that thing. Another thing comes. We take a part of that love and give to that. Another thing comes. We take a part of that love and give to that thing until what remains. God is saying, is that all the love you have for me left now? Rivals have come into our lives. Rivals have come into our way of thinking. Rivals have come into our devotion, into our attention. And now now he says, one thing I have against you, one thing thou lackest, because thou hast led thy first love. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. What does that mean to me? Remember how you took a part of the love you had for me, you gave it to that. A part of the love for me, you give it to that other one. A part of the love you had for me, you give it to that one. So that now all the rivals, as well as our Savior Redeemer, they are all together and they are struggling for the love we have. And we yield to those things we have given our love to. It says, remember how you are falling. How did I get to this point that now there are rivals of the Redeemer in my life? Okay, I gave the love to that thing. I said, Lord, help me. I will take the love and bring it back to Christ. I gave the love to that person and then I misunderstood loving my brothers and sisters and now I'm concentrating on them. What I can get from them, they cannot take me to heaven. I take that love beyond. I'm giving them the love I should have given to God. I take that back and bring it back again. I remember where I had fallen. I remember how those things seized my heart. I remember how those things distracted me. And then I get them back. That's how you recover all the love again for the Lord. It says, remember therefore from whence thou art falling and repent I turn around I say no more rivals with my redeemer and then and do the first works the things I used to do when I had that burning love and passionate love and zeal for the Lord now that I recover that first love I 
do what I used to do at the time I used to do it with the energy I used to do it and with the commitment I used to do it with the fervency I used to do it I do the false works it says or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except that repent. That tells us the people who tell lies. What I mean is, they tell lies in their theology. They tell lies in their preaching. They tell lies in their exhortation. What kind of lie? They say, God loves you. Period. Whether you love him back or not, don't worry. That's a lie. Whether you are devoted to him or not, don't worry, that's a lie. They say you are saved, you are saved. And you are saved by the love of God alone. Whether you still maintain the first love towards him or not, doesn't really matter. He loves you, that's a lie. Jesus said, one thing thou lackest. Jesus said, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. Now he says, you have a chance today. Repent. Turn around and get all that love you're taking from me. Give it back to me and then have your first love again and do the first works passionately like you used to do or else if you don't, if you say, I'm saved, I'm saved. If you say, it doesn't matter. If you say, rivals, don't worry, stay there. No, you, you, you're a rival to the Redeemer, and I'm not giving him all my love anymore. Stay there, don't worry. He says, I will come very quickly, and I will take your candlestick away, and there will be no light in your life or experience again. You will be in darkness. We are looking at uh, number two here. Number two, it is receiving what faith the Savior for eternal life. In John chapter 1, verse 12. John chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 12. But as many as received him, as many as received him, the house is full or the rooms are occupied and the king wants to come you have to evacuate all those people there if the king is going to come and stay abide with you you love this you love that you run after this you run after that all your time is gone all the room vacancy occupied. You don't have any way to love another person with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. If he is to come in, as many as received him, you have to evacuate. All those uh, tenants there, all those uh, people there, and have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords come in and abide there with you. And if there is sin, sins of every type already occupying the heart, the pride is sitting there and the lust is sitting there and the covetousness is sitting there and all the works of the flesh are stable there and they have occupied the heart and now he wants to come and behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come in then you say thank you Lord I, I, I prize you I value you above all the, all the tenants in my heart. And then you evacuate the heart, you drive them out, you repent of your sin, you come to the Lord, and as many as received him, you now receive him, him as he is. Him at his height and him as how precious he is to them. Those who receive him like that, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And then he tells us in verse 16, he says, 
and of his fullness have we all received. Hold on. We cannot be selfish of the Lord. The fullness what filled our heart. Negative, sinful, defiling. We must give it to him. We must get that out. If your heart is full already of those defiling things, Christ cannot come in because there's no space if that bucket is full. You cannot pour in any other thing again. If of his fullness we have all received, then of the fullness of Satan, flush them out. Of the fullness of the world, full, uh, flush them out. Of the fullness of degrading, shameful habit and life, flush all that out. Of his fullness have we all received grace for Great. Somebody say amen. amen. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith. By grace are you saved through faith. You have believed other personalities. And you took their word as the truest coin, and now Christ is presented unto you. Like you believed, Daddy and Mommy, early in life. Daddy, what do they call this? You said, Daddy said, they call it that. And then you pick up that, and you learn that, and you accept that. And you're not like your Daddy. Mommy, what do they call this vegetable? And Mommy tells you, and you hold on to that. You didn't doubt Mommy. And you didn't try to go and find out from other people. Mommy told me this is what they call that. Is it like that, madam? You don't check up. Now, you put all your faith, all the faith you have ever had. Faith in daddy and faith in mommy and faith in the driver that you take a taxi, take me there and you just accept absolutely. You take all that faith and all that trust and all that confidence and you now put it on Christ, I died for you. No argument, I accept. I paid the price for you. No argument, I accept. And now, for you to have this eternal life, this salvation, this is what you do. You don't go and ask another church leader, another person, another person, a theologian there. Christ has said, by me only will you be saved. I accept that. And when you manifest that faith on what he has done and what he has said, more than you believed anybody in your life, then the salvation will come because for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We're coming to number three here. Number three is redemption and following his steps into everlasting life. Following his steps into everlasting life. We cannot follow Satan into everlasting life because he's not going to heaven everlasting life. Mind who you follow. We cannot follow the prodigal backslider into everlasting life because the backslider, prodigal backslider, is not going to heaven. If he remains on that road, mind who you follow. We cannot follow an ignorant believer. He's a believer, praise God. He's saved, praise God. But he doesn't know the Bible. He doesn't have the words of Christ. He doesn't know the path that Christ is taking. We cannot follow an ignorant believer. It will not get us to heaven. We cannot follow a pilgrim on the broad way because the broad way leads to this destruction, eternal, everlasting, unending perdition and destruction. We cannot follow them. The only one we can follow to get to life eternal. Didn't you hear what Jesus said? Sell what you have. Give to the poor and come after me. 
and follow me. That's the way to life eternal. The way to life eternal. We have the redemption. And then we keep on following now in the footsteps of Christ. It tells us in John chapter 8, reading from verse 11. John chapter 8, verse 11, she said, No man, Lord, Jesus says unto her, Neither do I condemn you. You. I condemn your adultery. I condemn your fornication. I condemn your act of sin, of course. But I came to save. I came to redeem. I came to set the captive free. So neither do I condemn you now to destruction, perdition, eternal. But I want to get you to life eternal. Therefore, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Then in verse 12, in verse 12, then speak Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth, followeth, not followed, only in the past, but as now, uh, so fully, not the people that say, Lord, I'm taking vacation from following you in the future. I will now come back and follow. No. The people that get saved and they keep on following and they follow and they follow and they're never tired because the Jesus they are following gives them strength. The Jesus they are following gives them grace. The Jesus they are following supplies strength, strength, strength day by day. And so we have that grace, we have that strength, we have that ability, and we keep on following. In the day we we'll follow, in the night we we'll follow. When other people are trying to impose on us their personality and are saying, follow me, we say, no, sir. We're already following Christ, and you are much, much less than Christ. And so we follow, we follow, we follow Christ. When we're alone, all by ourselves, we follow Christ. What will Christ do? When we have other people, and other people are trying to say, all of us who are going this direction, and they do not have the knowledge of Christ, the vision of Christ, the strength of Christ, who abandon them, who are following Christ. He says, and he that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. First Peter chapter 2, we're reading from verse 21. In First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 21, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. We'll come to point number three now. Point number three is the sustained, excelling liberality and favors for the earnest evangelizing laborers. Peter, John, James, Matthew, and all the others, the 12 disciples that had been called by Christ and they were following the Lord and they were liberal in their giving themselves to the Lord. And then God is also liberal unto them. And he gives them all their heart's desires and favors that they never knew they could have. But because of what they had done and they had forsaken all things and they came to the Lord and, and they remained with the Lord, the Lord said there will be liberality. They'll be excelling liberality, sustained in their lives. All their needs will be supplied and favors because of their earnest evangelizing 
labor. We look at this under three perspectives. Number one, laborers constantly living all to follow Christ. Number two, liberality is consistently and limitlessly given to the consecrated. And number three, living courageously and never looking back from his commission. We're looking at number one. Number one, laborers constantly living all to follow Christ. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 19 and verse 27. We're looking at this. It said, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all things, all, and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Living, they left all. But now, after we left all, and we were saved. What if the following week anything comes again to take our time, to take our attention, to take our strength, to take our consecration, and to demand that part of force that we had led, we pick that up again and we give attention to other things. If we did that, we will not be constantly, constantly living all. When you leave your luxury, and another kind of luxury will invite you, and you leave that for Christ. When you leave your substance at the beginning, when the Lord called you, and now, today, at this time, he wants you to still leave this one now for his sake and for his work. If you don't, you are not constantly living all. When you give your time, at the first time you came to the Lord, you gave your time, and now you're saved, now you're sanctified, you're now serving the Lord, and now you're doing whatever, and you cannot leave your time and then serve him, and you're now serving yourself, you're not constantly living all. And that's what happened when Peter said, I Go a fishing. And then what he had left before, you must constantly leave that in your mind. I gave that to the Lord. I left that for the Lord. You must always constantly giving and giving and giving up what you had left before. But he said, I go a fishing. And then uh, the old story was repeated because that night they caught nothing. The first time Jesus met him, uh, before he left all things to follow Christ, he caught nothing until Jesus said, throw your net there. And now since he went back on uh, taking back again uh, what he had given to the Lord, he caught nothing. And Jesus came and said, children, have you any bread? And he said, we have none. We've gone back to the old lifestyle of grabbing, grabbing, and grabbing. We've gone back to the old lifestyle of greed. And because of the greed, then we have nothing. He said, throw your net there. And he threw it there. And he caught a lot of fish. And John said, it's the Lord. That's how he had It's coming. He found us here. Where we have not left everything now because of what had happened. And now, Jesus came to Peter, Simon Peter, son of Jonah, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? Can you forsake this again? Can you keep on forsaking your comfort, your comfort zone, and then follow me? Do you love me more than this? Yes, Lord, I love you. He demands that. Not just what you forsook in the past, what you forsake now and every day. Peter, Simon, lovest thou me 
no comparison anymore now not just more than this fish lovest thou me period lord i love you simon peter lovest thou me above your comfort your convenience above your desires above your wishes above your personal human management lovest thou me lord it was sorry it was sorrowful you know all hearts you know that i love you all right if you do that like you did at the beginning forsaking all things feed my sheep then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all. That's good. Keep on forsaking all. Keep on forsaking all. And we'll follow thee. Keep on following. What shall we have thereof? Peter. That's a great question. What shall we have thereof? There's one condition that you'll keep on following, that you will not deny him. Even at Gethsemane, you'll not deny him. Even at the judgment hall, you will not deny him from now until he comes for you to take care of. If you keep on following, then you're going to receive a Lord. The laborers for the Lord must keep on continually living all and following him. We're looking at Philippians chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 7. Philippians chapter 3 verse 7. But what things were gained to me? Those I counted loss for Christ. Look at verse 8. It says, yea, yes, doubtless. And I count all things, but loss, I counted for loss in verse 7. And even until now, I still count all things, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them till today, till today, and do count them, but that I may win Christ. Verse 9, in verse 9, I'll be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Number 2. In number two, it says liberalities consistently, limitlessly given to the consecrated. Given to the consecrated. In Luke chapter 22, verse 28, ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations in my trials, in my challenges, in all the opposition that those Pharisees and Sadducees had against him, these people continued with him. What would he give them? What reward would they have? Verse 29, And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father as appointed unto me. I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father has appointed unto me. Verse 30, in verse 30, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. This one here, this is not my kingdom. If you continue with me, and I get to my kingdom, the everlasting kingdom. It says, you will eat and drink with me at my table in my kingdom. And sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. 
What's he saying? He said, David the king, when we get over there, yes, he's there, but he will not be the one sitting on the throne to judge Israel. He said, Solomon will not be the one sitting on the judgment seat to judge Israel. And you said, even all the prophets of old, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they were very faithful. They will not be the one to judge the 12 types of Israel, but ye who have continued with me, who have left all and are still living all, and you give yourself completely without reservation, without reserve, you'll be the one sitting on the 12 thrones judging all the children of Israel. We're coming to number three here. Number three, it says, living courageously and never looking back from his commission. Never looking back from what you have chosen, from what you have dedicated your life to, but you will be with me if you don't look back in Mark chapter 10 looking at the latter part of verse 30 it says and in the world to come eternal life you'll have this 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 but you'll have with that persecution and with the persecution, you remain and abide with the Lord. It says in the world to come, you'll have everlasting life, eternal life. That's what you will have. I said that is what you will have. But we'll keep on consistently and constantly with the Lord. Whatever persecution may come our way. And then in verse 31, but many that are forced shall be last. Many that are forced shall be last. Why, Lord? Because after they started following and they gave all and committed all, it came to a point they are not backsliding. They were still following after the Lord. But now, they were no more giving everything from their heart, their life, everything they had, everything God demanded, but it was still following. And it says many that are forced shall be last. Why? Because at the beginning on your search, Mark, go. And then we took off. And then we were running and running beyond and above other people. And we're looking at the time and we're looking at our circumstances. And then we're slowing down until the people that were running slow, slow, slow before, they gathered strength, they gathered fire, they gathered power, and they shot through and they ran ahead and they kept on running ahead of us. And we see them now, and they're running ahead of us. We don't mind. Let them run. After all, for all these uh, many years have been running, let, let them run. Let them run. I even give them the baton. I want to rest a little and then Christ comes. And those who are forced are now last on the line. And those who are last on the line, uh, they have not gone forward. And now, the reward they have is not only going to be for 50 years or 100 years, it's going to be forever and ever. And those who are last that are not forced, they're now forced, they're now on top forever and ever and ever. And those who are forced and now they slow down and they now show like if they don't have the intention to keep the fire burning and they are last, when they are last at the time they enter the kingdom of God for a hundred years, for a thousand years, for a million years, forever and ever, they remain last. You can make your choice. What do you want to be? How do you want to be when you get to the kingdom of God? Do you want to remain slow and sluggish and last because, you know, the road is too hard for you? Or do you want to say he's coming? 
what remains is not as much as what has gone before and therefore whatever tiredness and whatever weariness I'm going to pray and wait on the Lord so that I receive strength and power and then I will mount up with wings as eagles and I keep running the same speed or even greater speed that I'm at before I keep on running you remain false you'll be false and when we get to heaven you'll be false in Jesus name it says and many that are forced shall be last and the last shall be false what's your position where will you be at what level will you be when the Lord comes you can get back your first love today you can drive out all those rivals from your life and you can drive away all those people that compete with the love of Christ in your life and you can say Lord give me more strength and give me more grace and give me more fire power so that with the strength of the Lord the strength of the Spirit I'll keep on running the Lord grant you the grace the Lord grant you the strength and the Lord grant you the willingness to forsake all things and follow Christ at whatever price it may take you will follow in Jesus name let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer and say Lord here am I I will keep on following tell the Lord here am I I will keep on following. Tell the Lord, here am I. I will keep on following. He wants us to follow him. He wants us to count the cause. He wants us as to run to Christ, as to run years gone by, start running again and run to Christ. As to ask the Lord many years ago, ask the Lord again. Do you have the Lord anymore? I want to travel. Should I? I want to pick up this. Should I? I want to make you the priority of my life so that all my questions I'm asking from you, I'm not going to go into self-management and I want eternal life and I want to retain that eternal life and I want to do, I want to know what should I do, how should I go, how should I consecrate, how should I pray that I may retain eternal life. I evacuate all those tenants in my heart, all those things that are taking all my attention. I evacuate my heart of everything. I want Christ and Christ alone. Christ and Christ alone. Christ and Christ alone. I want him to be my savior. I want him to be my Lord. I want him to be the control of my life. I want him to be all in all in my life. You want the Lord present in your life. You want the Lord prominent in your life. All those, uh, you know, life of the world and the actions of the world and, and the behavior of the world and the concentration of the world evacuate them. What are you trying to gain? Are you spending your time? What are you giving your time to? You give your time, you give your energy, you give your attention to the things of this world and they will soon vanish away and you don't have steadfastness with the Lord. What shall it profit you? Why don't you examine your life, examine your ways, examine your passion, examine your pursuit and say, Lord, all these rivals must go. But you and you alone will be my Lord and my Savior. Give yourself entirely, fully, completely unto the Lord without any reservation. Tell the Lord, O oh Lord, my heart I give to you. My attention I give to you. My concentration, consecration, I give unto you. Thou and thou alone will possess me. Money will not possess you. Men will not possess you. Women will not possess you. Substance will not possess you. The love of money 
is the root of all evil. When you love money above the master, you love wealth above his word, you love riches above righteousness. Why don't you come and say, Lord, I've discovered myself. The one thing thou lackest that he wants you to give up. That kind of being possessed by the world, he wants you to give that up. And he wants you to say, I come. I'll do your will. I'll obey your word. I will submit to your stated condition of having everlasting life. Talk to the Lord. Be sincere. And make that surrender irrevocable. I surrender now. I surrender fully. I surrender completely. I surrender without looking back. He that lays his hand on the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Bring all your heart. Bring all your love. Bring all your consecration. Bring all your devotion. Bring who you are completely, completely, completely to serve the Lord. Now, henceforth, until time shall last. Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, despised the shame. And you, for the joy, for the reward that is set before you, you despise the persecution. You despise the grabbing things of the world that sees the minds of men, that arrests the attention of pilgrims toward heaven. And then you lay everything on the altar, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him. I freely give our love and trust him to follow him all the days of your life practically follow him persistently follow him passionately follow him purposefully following the Lord every step of the way you will not go back like the rich, young ruler. He was sad because he had great possession. Anything too hard to give up for your Lord, for your master, for your redeemer, to live a life of consecration, day after day, never looking back, yielding yourself to the Lord, counting the cost, counting the consequence. If you go back, you lose his favor, you lose the fruit, 
you lose his goodness here in life and then in the life to come you miss eternal life you miss sitting on the throne and being part of the saints that will judge the world you miss the privilege that others who keep on to the end the privilege they will enjoy not only for 10 years 20 years 100 years a thousand years but forever and ever and ever Give of your best to the master. Give of your time to the master. Give of your treasure to the master. Give of your possession to the master. Do as he has said. Follow me. Do as he has said. Give your time to the Lord. Quality time. Do as he has said. Let your soul be glad as you hear him. This is the way. What he therein do as he has said. Be sanctified. Be purged, be purified. Don't allow the things of this world, the tangible things, the touchable things, the visible things of this world to seize your heart from the Lord. Give all to Him continually, constantly, consistently. Do you see? I said follow him follow through love him above any man love him above any woman love him above anyone let him see that you have that first love, first consecration, first devotion unto him and to him alone. Live in the consciousness that you are obeying every word of God. Ask for more grace. Ask for more strength. Ask for divine ability. And serve him. And follow him. With all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, with every passion, a strength of the Spirit in you, love Him, serve Him, hold unto the Lord, keep your first love, your first zeal, your first passion, your first devotion, whatever you've laid on the altar before, don't pick any part of it away from the altar again. Keep all the sacrifice on the altar.
In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for drawing us nearer to yourself, revealing your mind, exposing your mind unto everyone. You have touched different courts in the hearts of different people, members, ministers, everyone. We pray, Lord, our heart will respond appropriately to you in everything in Jesus name Amen. and the grace and the strength and the inner sincerity transparency to follow you we pray Lord grant you everyone in Jesus name Amen. We're not talking today about giving us this and giving us that. You know what to give us. You know what to reward us. Once we stand and stay at the altar and we lay everything on the altar, you're a good Lord, a good master, a good manager, a good director. You will do what is right for everyone. Amen. But we pray you grant us the faithfulness now henceforth and forever grant us lord the devotion the yieldedness the submissiveness that we surrender everything unto you in jesus name Amen. and whatever you see best we pray lord grant to every child of yours grant to every saint of us help us lord to take care of what we can take care of which is the surrender, the consecration, the submission, the obedience. We do what you've told us to do. And we know we don't have to pester you and we don't have to push you. We don't have to drive you. Do this and do that. You will do what you can do. And we will do what we ought to do. We pray, Lord, that that grace to be very conscious of the presence of the Lord, the precept of the Lord, the demand of the Lord, that grace will be conscious of that and to always do our part, give to everyone. And we trust, we trust, we believe everything that is just, everything that is good, everything that is profitable, you will give unto your people. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.